My mother passed away three months ago. It wasn't unexpected. She had been suffering from lung cancer for years, and she had finally reached the end of the road. The day that she died, I went to the local bar that she and my father had first met at and had a few drinks. I didn't do this because I didn't care. Quite the opposite, actually. I did it because the shell of a woman that had died in the hospital hadn't been my mother for a long time. And I did it because this place had always been special to my parents. I couldn't think of a better way to say goodbye now that they were both gone. I sat down in a lonely booth in the back of the bar and took a white envelope out of my pocket. A year prior, when the disease had started to affect her mind as well as her body, she had spent a couple of days alone in her room writing a letter for me. She had made me promise that I wouldn't read it until she was gone. She was the kind of woman that believed in being open and honest, and yet here she was, being all mysterious. The waiter brought the first of what would be many beers, and I thanked him before turning my attention back to the envelope. I absently tapped it on the edge of the table as I considered it. The expression on my mother's face as she had handed it to me, I hadn't recognized it. Finally decided that there was no point in dragging things out. I opened the envelope and extracted the stack of papers from inside. Unfolding the papers, I flattened them out on the table and began to read. This is the story that my mother chose to tell me after her death. In 1964, the year of my seventh birthday, there was a night where the rain seemed to fall forever. As a child, I used to love the sound of the rain. I lived in a small house near the lake, and my sister and I used to sit at the window watching the water run down the window as we listened to it, tap, 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 against the tin roof. Marie was a few years older than I was, and she was at that age where she didn't want to hang around with her kid sister much. But rainy days were different. Those were our days together. I don't think that I've ever been happier, more content, than I was in front of that window with her in those moments. On this particular evening, the rain had started just as the sun was setting on the horizon. It's rare that the sun would be out while the rain fell like that. The lake was less than a block away from where we lived, and Marie and I watched as the water swirled and churned in bright shades of red and orange. My parents weren't home this evening. They had gone over to the neighbor's house to play rummy. That was what they had told us anyway. Whenever they would go over to visit these particular neighbors, they would always come back smelling of smoke and alcohol. At the time, I took them at their word, just like any child at that age would have. But as I grew older, I suspected that they were indulging in other activities and just playing cards. Marie decided that we should go outside water was truly beautiful, and she was eager to get a better look at it. I quickly agreed. I always agreed with what Marie told me. She was my big sister, and that meant that she could do no wrong in my eyes. She helped me get my yellow raincoat, hat, and boots on before she got the large umbrella out of the holder by the door. She led me out onto the porch and opened the umbrella before leading the way down the stone steps and up the walkway. We held hands as we crossed the street and walked down the sidewalk leading towards the beach. As we walked, we passed the large park that stood between us and our destination. It was empty. 
the rain having driven all the children indoors and away from their games. I remember thinking that it was sad to see the park without children playing in it. I couldn't describe what I was feeling then, and I'm not sure that I can now. It was like I was seeing a place that was meant to spread joy, completely devoid of it. I've looked back at the memory a lot over the years, and I believe that, that was the exact moment that I started to feel uneasy. I wasn't scared. Marie was there, and I knew that I was safe in her presence. It was more that there was this sense of wrongness hanging in the air. I can't explain it better than that. I think that Marie felt it too, because she pulled me a bit closer as we continued toward the lake. She kept looking around as if she was suddenly nervous, but there wasn't anything dangerous nearby, so we continued on. We reached the large stone steps that led down from the park to the beach. They were slippery from the rain, so we took them slowly to make sure that we didn't fall. There were other children standing on the wet sand. Many of them I recognized from our neighborhood, and others I didn't. All of them were staring at the waves, painted by the sunset's colors, smiling at each other, and pointing out at the water. I didn't notice at the time that there were no adults present. I didn't think that there was anyone there over the age of 16, although I can't be sure. Standing there on that beach, watching those burning waves, it was like we were in our own little universe. I'm not sure when I started noticing the shape far off on the horizon. First, it was a small black dot on the water, barely visible against the sky. But as I watched it, it steadily grew closer. The chatter from the other children quieted down as they began to notice the shape as well. The closer it came, the less they spoke, until finally the only sounds were the rain and the waves crashing into the beach. The shape drew nearer, and soon I was able to make it out through the rain. It was a lone man in a small boat. He was wearing a black rain slipper, and the hood was pulled up so that it not only protected his head from the rain, but also obscured his face. The boat was old, the kind of sloop that I had seen in pirate movies that my sister and I had watched when our parents weren't around the kind that the pirates launched from their larger ships to go ashore. As he came closer, I saw that he wasn't alone. Behind him was a long line of other sloops, and although none of these had a captain, they still followed the mariner. When the mariner's boat reached the shore, he allowed it to push up into the sand of the beach before stepping out over the side. He was tall, the tallest man I had ever encountered in my life. He loomed over all the children as he looked down at all of us in turn. The other sloops arrived at the beach, forming a neat line that stretched across the beach. All of them were made from the same black wood, and each of them was empty. Without turning to look at the newly arrived boats, the mariner motioned for us to move closer to them. Both Marie and I did as we were instructed. So did all the other children gathered on the beach. It didn't feel like we were approaching danger. Instead, it felt like some great adventure and that the boats contained a fantastic treasure for all of us. I noticed that there was exactly enough boats there to be one for each child. That seemed to be exactly how things should have been. One specific boat for each specific child. I walked towards my boat, knowing without a doubt that it was for me, and only me. As I drew closer, I found that the sloop wasn't empty after all. Sitting on the wooden bench, its head tilted to one side, was a stuffed Leo lion dog. 
Leo Lion was my favorite thing in the whole world. He was a lion character on the show Bingo's Circus Extravaganza, a show that I had watched every afternoon after school. While the show featured a large group of characters, Leo Lion was the one that I became fixated on. This wasn't just a stuffed animal, it was real. Leo Lion raised one short arm and waved, a big smile spreading across his face. He then scooted over slightly on the bench and patted it. He wanted me to sit next to him. I felt a smile stretching across my own face as a wave of delight washed over me. I was going to go on my own adventure with Leo Lion, just like on the show. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Marie moving towards the boat next to mine. Maybe Leo Lion and I could even join her on her adventure as well. Although sadly, she didn't have anything waiting for her in her boat. I had just about reached the sloop when my shoe caught in the sand, tripping off the side. I accidentally fell into the corner of Marie's boat before I managed to regain my balance. My head was just over the side of the sloop as I looked up. I had been wrong. There was indeed something in Marie's boat. Something horrible. Sitting on the bench was a short figure out of a nightmare. It resembled a thin, rotting corpse, with patches of bone visible in multiple spots where the skin was missing. Its lips were gone, exposing black gums that seemed to barely manage to hold in the rotted teeth. Its eyes were just empty sockets, and only small wispy tufts of hair grew from its scalp. I recoiled back away from the boat. Whatever spell I had been under was gone now. Leo Lion was no longer in my boat. Instead, he had been replaced by one of the rotting, yet still somehow moving corpses. I saw that each of the sloops had a similar figure waiting for an approaching child to reach it. I turned to Marie. She was grinning and still walking towards the sloop. She couldn't see what I could. The spell of the mariner hadn't been broken for her. Grabbing her hand, I pulled as hard as I could. The movement slowed, but it didn't come to a stop. She didn't even seem to notice what I was doing. She simply kept moving closer to the sloop while dragging me behind her. I dug my feet in and pulled back with everything I had in me. Marie's hand was wet, and the beach was too slick from the rain to keep me upright. I lost my grip on her and fell backwards, hitting the back of my head hard on the sand. There was a momentary burst of light in front of my eyes, and the air whooshed out of my lungs. I struggled to sit up as Marie climbed into the boat and sat down on the bench. Forcing myself back onto my feet, I took a step towards her and started to call out her name. Before I could go any further, however, the mariner was suddenly in front of me. He stared down at me, the rain slicker reminding me of a grim reaper's cloak. As I looked up at him, I could now see that his face wasn't concealed. He didn't have one. Where his face should have been was a black void of nothingness. I quickly looked away. Something inside of me was certain that I'd go mad if I stared into it too long. I tried to go around him. I knew that if I could just reach Marie, she and I would be able to escape together. The mariner remained in front of me. I didn't see him move but he stayed between me and my sister. The boats began to back away from the beach. As one, they turned so that their fronts were facing the horizon and sailed off. I was crying now, and I screamed Marie's name over and over again. The mariner didn't move out of my way until the boats were nearly out of sight. When he finally stepped out of my way, saw that two of the sloops remained, his and the one that I had nearly gotten on. The mariner raised one gloved hand and pointed at mine. It took me a moment to comprehend what he meant. He was saying that there was still time to join my sister where the boats had taken her. 
I stood there frozen. I was terrified, and I didn't know what to do. The mariner simply watched me for a long moment before turning around and getting back onto his sloop. I kept looking between him and the boat meant for me, my fear taking away the ability to make a decision. The mariner ended up making it for me. As he stood upright and unmoving, both his sloop and mine went back out onto the water before turning towards the horizon and following the others. I stood there staring after him, feeling more cold and alone than I ever had. As the boats disappeared from view, the rain stopped. The day was silent except for the waves crashing over the beach. The lake didn't care about the 22 children that had been taken that day. It didn't care that I had lost the most important person in the world to me. All it cared about was its eternal struggle against the shoreline. Now, my dearest daughter, you know my darkest secret. When I was needed the most by the person that I needed the most, I was a coward. I should have boarded that boat and gone after her. I don't know where the mariner took her, what his purpose was, but at least she wouldn't have been alone. Sometimes, when I'm at the beach, I look out at the horizon and think that I see a dark shape in the distance. Just for a moment, I think that it's my sister coming back to me after all these years. Then, when reality sinks in, my heart breaks again. I know that I don't have much time left on this earth. Even now, I can feel the cancer growing inside of me. I wonder if this horrible growth is a different kind of boat that has come to carry me off over that fiery water to wherever it took Marie. I love you. I'm sorry.